Good morning. Good morning. How are you? It's another lovely day in paradise. Oh, it was until that lorry drove past me. Mind you, he's driving like a lunatic, so I think we'll be all right speed-wise. Besides, I'm not starting until a bit later today. I'm actually going to arrive. Keep up. I'm going to arrive early today. Although I'm going to be late, so I'm late for the normal time. But we're not starting until later, so that I'll actually be early. So that's good, isn't it? We're starting later because we went to see the Lion King last night as a practice. Very good. Very, uh, uh, very colourful, and uh, you know the animals, the way that they convert the human beings into animals and make one a giraffe and one a jackal and, you know, and have the birds flying around and everything. Very uh, impressive. I won't, you know, spoil it too much, but you won't be disappointed. And I don't think the tickets were that expensive. It was, I think it was 50 pounds for a stall seat, including a coach ride there and back. So <clears throat> I don't think that's expensive. I mean, even for the five of us. It was, uh, you know, £250 for a night out, and then you've got a, a beef burger and a <clears throat> and, um, couple of gin and tonics on top for everybody. It's alright, isn't it? I think you're allowed to spend £250 a year on your staff in terms of uh, hospitality, you know, and celebrations and stuff. And I thoroughly recommend it, you know, I think it's money well spent. It's, so one a thousand or two thousand pounds. I know there'll be dentists will be thinking, oh, you know, that's I could draw that thousand out. You know, <laughs> that could be mine, my mine or mine. <laughs> but uh, you know, you'll get. I think you get value for money for uh, doing things like this. You know, they appreciate it. They uh, <clears throat> they talk fondly of jobs like that in later years. You know, the, you know, remember that job when we used to do. You know, where we used to go bowling, where we used to go to the bingo, where we used to uh, go go-karting, go to the Lion King, go out for Christmas meals and stuff like that. And, um, you get you get very good loyalty. I mean, staff, someone would be mad to leave a job like that, wouldn't they? I mean, you just don't find jobs like that, you know. You, don't, you can't go from one job like that to another job like that. They're just... Uh, uh, like hen's teeth. So anyway, the uh, <clears throat> I'm still uh, I'm still having trouble with the old video. I recorded a fantastic video yesterday. Fantastic it was. In fact, I'll go so far as to say it was probably my best video ever. And I was halfway down the bypass, and the camera just went black, and that was it. It you know just conked out, and it's gone, and it's gone like at South Park so and I was I oh, was this massive great rambling anecdote about how the engineer came along and and uh, just assumed that the uh, problem was the same as the first problem that he'd been called out to which was that the impeller was stuck and that the impeller was you know and that he was the problem was that because he had an impeller on the shelf in the workshop he decided it was an impeller problem and uh, and just disconnected the whole thing and uh, and was about to take it away in the van and when I turned up I said to him you know what do you think and he said well you know when they get stuck it's the impeller and I said well it wasn't stuck and we should have seen his face because that was you know I, I mean I wasn't there the first time but he told me that it was stuck and it was in the impeller and he shifted it with a screwdriver and uh, you know, like the constipated mathematician who worked it out with a pencil. And uh, the uh, second time he came, he just uh, didn't even bother trying to unstick it. He just started unscrewing it all, and and it wasn't actually jammed at that point. I I could uh, I'd been able to rotate the impeller quite freely. So it's a case of the uh, you know the problem having to fit the solution. So he's taking it away and now we're going to get a new impeller, whether it's the impeller or not. Or more likely it'll be the impeller and some faulty wiring or something. And anyway, I'm going to I'm going to buy the impeller that's on his workshop shelf. 
Oh, I've had a lot. I tell you, I've had so many problems lately. This is, if you're a bit squeamish, fast forward now, about five minutes. But Mrs. W, who buys my clothes, it's very useful, you know, isn't it? It's useful. When your wife buys your clothes, it's very useful. So she buys my shirts, she buys my trousers. She's in Canada at the moment, visiting a friend of hers. And um, so she, before she went, she bought me a load of socks and underpants, stuck them in the door, said we've got some new socks and some underpants. Can I find the opening in the front of the underpants? No, I cannot. It's some new arrangement. They can't leave things exactly as they were, can they? No, they have to change things round. So they've got some funny double bloody flat type arrangement and I just cannot get it right. I've had it down the left leg, I've had it down the right leg, <clears throat> I've had it over the top and I, I just cannot get it through the middle. And it's embarrassing. You're in the you know the old toilet and everybody's standing up there and you're like and everyone's looking at you thinking what you're doing you know ha! I mean can it be that small that you can't even find it and I'm like just get on with it you know all right I'll be all right in a minute as soon as I find the way there's a way it's like a bloody adventure game trying to get through my underpants anyway patients don't know this do they when they come to work, and like I've got a patient at 9.30, and then she'll be sitting there for a checkup, or he'll be sitting there for a checkup, and they won't know that this is on my mind. You know, this is my problem for the day. It's a good job we ask them what their problems are, isn't it? I say to you, you know, how's it going? What's, uh, you know, what you done anything interesting lately? I mean, what would happen if they said to me, have you done anything interesting lately? I'd say, yeah, yeah, I've spent the last week trying to find my cock that's a recipe isn't it for the GDC I can see that I can just see myself standing in front of the GDC I wouldn't even bother trying to explain that I'll just I'll just hand in my registration certificate and say here you go I've had a good run you know been fun well, actually hasn't been much fun to be honest you know it's been, been a bit of a bloody stressful dreary bore but you know, I'll give in, I'll give in. You've got me. You and the CQC between you and the bloody uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, the uh, the uh, phonographic, uh, pornographic performance people, whatever they're called. <sighs> it's funny how the camera always cuts out. And the other problem is, right, you record like eight minutes of video I've done so far, and then if it doesn't terminate properly, then you lose all that. So it's not like it's recording it as it goes along. What happens is, it, well, it is obviously recording it as it goes along, but when you press finish, it wraps it up, it puts it, or it terminates it all, and it tidies it all up, and it, it wraps it all up in a wrapper. And that MP4 is not the format, the MP4 is the wrapper. So it's a bit like uh, you know going to Tesco's and uh, and driving back and uh, and your wife saying where's the shopping and you say well what are you beeping for oh fuel beeps all the time this car beep 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 yeah so you get home and then there's no shopping and your wife says where's the shopping and you say well uh, 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 before we left the before we left the supermarket, I forgot to put it in a carrier bag, so it fell out all over the place, so I haven't brought it. And that's what happened yesterday. I had one, uh, one the first half, well, it turned, wasn't supposed to be the first half, but it turned out to be the first half, was uh, crashed, and so I restarted the camera and recorded the second half, and, And then when I got to work, I found out that I got the second half and I didn't have the first half. So what's the, what's the use of that? My best podcast ever. Lost. Like, you know, like the work of other geniuses on the cutting room floor, thrown away in the bin, in a skip. Except it's gone into the digital ether. I've got an appointment with my accountant this afternoon. I've requested it, just in case you... I've said to him, I want to talk about Bitcoin. He doesn't know anything about Bitcoin. 
he doesn't know anything about Skype. So why, why, why have I asked a friend of Whiteman with him to talk about Bitcoin? Why? I don't know why. I'd be better off ringing up President Obama and asking him for advice. He knows more about Bitcoin than my accountant. The question we now have to ask is if technologically it is possible to make an impenetrable device or system where the encryption is so strong that there's no key, there's no door at all, then how do we apprehend the child pornographer? How do we solve uh, a, or disrupt a terrorist plot? What mechanisms do we have available to even do simple things like tax enforcement? Because if, in fact, you can't crack that at all, government can't get in, then everybody's walking around with a Swiss bank account in their pocket. But the whole point is, I want to find out what the situation is with regard to Bitcoin and the Inland Revenue. I want to find out what the state of play is, where we are, whether there's anything's happened. And I bet, bet nothing's happened because in America, where there were far, far more Bitcoin holders and far larger holders than there are in the UK. They, I think about 800 of them, there, and there they treat it as a, an asset, so you have to pay capital gains tax on it. In fact, every time you buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin in the United States, you're supposed to uh, work out when you bought that Bitcoin and how much you paid for it, and how much, if anything, it's gone up in the meantime, what the difference is, and pay capital gains tax on the difference. So they don't, they're dumb, the Americans, they aren't, and they are dumb. That's why I won't go back there. They are, they're too dumb for me, you know. They're like, a, they're like a child with a sharp pair of scissors, you know. <laughs> they're too dangerous to me. They're fortunately don't do too much damage to themselves. They damage the world a lot, but if you go there, you will, you know, you run a chance of, of running into their dumbness. Their, my smartness intersecting with their dumbness is a, would be a recipe for disaster. It'd be the, you know, the matter meeting the antimatter. There'd be one, one hell of an explosion. <laughs> so, so they've classified this thing as, a, as an asset and you have to work out capital gains tax on it. Over here we treat it as a foreign currency, which is sensible, because that's what it is basically. It's a non, it's a non-state currency basically, that's what it, but they, they don't have, there's no, the concept of a non-state currency doesn't exist. So a foreign is the closest they can come to it. And there's no capital gains tax payable on foreign currency bank accounts and any gains in foreign currency bank accounts so then you have to ask yourself whether a Bitcoin account which is effectively not a, a bank account in the conventional sense because it's basically an entry in a worldwide ledger whether you're holding the private keys to the Bitcoins in that you know at that address constitutes a foreign currency bank account and is therefore exempt from capital gains tax? Now the answer is nobody knows. And, and my accountant certainly doesn't bloody know. And I, but I was hoping they might pull something out of the bag, you know, because I was hoping they might say, well, yeah, you know, we haven't had to look into this, but we've got our own back channels and we've had a little, you know, because they do know people who work for the Inland Revenue. And the answer is the Inland Revenue is as clueless as they are. And so they've written back to me, the accountants have, because I said to them, oh, this is what I want to talk about Bitcoin. And because uh, I don't want them to say, yeah, right, Derek, what's it, you know, what is it? You want to declare some uh, 50 pound income from one of the telegraph poles on your farm? I'll be like, no, <laughs> I want to talk about Bitcoin. Oh, uh, uh. 
Oh, right, okay. You know, for 30 minutes of blagging it. So, no, I told them I want to talk about Bitcoin because I want to see, you know, I want them to come prepared, you know, I want them to come tooled up, kitted up to tell me. But what they've said is that they're very much being treated on a case by case basis at the moment which means they haven't had a case. So the first case, they're going to look at that and they're going to treat that on a case-by-case -case basis. Bearing in mind that there's 300 million people live in America and only 800 people have ever declared any, any income, any taxable income, any taxable gain. This is during a period when the total net aggregated value of cryptocurrencies has shot up from something like 20 to 120 billion. And nobody's made a capital gain. You know, I mean, really, amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> They're taking the attitude that you know, you've got a, before you can tax it, you can find it. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, so we'll we'll have to wait and see what they say. I want to see what they, you know, see where they are with it. I have no desire to be the first UK test case. For Bitcoin, I honestly I don't want that, and I don't see why I should be. I'll, I'll, um, you know, there's eventually there'll be an industry body, and the, in the UK there'll be the UK Cryptocurrency Holders Association, and they'll sit down with the Inland Revenue, and they'll thrash out some sort of unsatisfactory arrangement which will consist of them taxing from bbc radio kent Sorry. looking first of all at the M way in which the fa investigated mm. her concerns about not shut up i'm gonna have to put a brick through that center panel which is a shame because it's it's actually quite a nice led see that did you hear that the car just started on its own just i'm bewildered I am. I'm like a sock in the tumble dryer of life at the moment. I don't. I, the world is starting to disintegrate around me. Things are happening and I can't explain it. It's madness, isn't it? So I'm going to have to get my tricorn hat out again and start walking around in my, uh, you know. Yeah, that's must, uh, must pop into Tesco's on the way back and get some aluminium foil. So, yeah, where was I? Yeah, so, or more likely, what will happen is that the, um, there'll be a... Come on, it's only roadworks. Honestly, they're just tarmacking one simple junction with four, four roads going into one junction and they're tarmacking it. You know, and then what? Well, you know, they, they laid the whole of the Great Western Railway overnight, and they're going to take a week to tarmac one junction with four roads, causing massive, massive tailbacks. What will probably happen is that there will end up being a jurisdiction where Bitcoin is effectively tax-free. So I don't know. I don't know whether it's I don't know, <laughs> probably St Lucia. God knows they need the income, and. Uh, or we'll end up on uh, Barbuda or somewhere. And uh, everyone who's got any sort of decent amount of Bitcoin will move will move there and they will then just... Because the Bitcoin move with you. It's not like you need the government permission to transfer it out of the country. It's never... It's not actually in the country. It's not anywhere. You know, it's on, the re it's on every computer that holds a copy of the blockchain. So... Uh, and any one of them... He's turning left. He's turning left. I could see that. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, so uh, it's not. It's not sort of uh, located in any one jurisdiction. That's the trouble. So I think you'll be. You will probably be able to uh, take the take your uh, Bitcoin stash to whichever jurisdiction is most Bitcoin friendly. And there will be a competition to find the most, you know, to be the most Bitcoin friendly jurisdiction. Uh, in the same way as there's competition, Maryland is the most business friendly state in America and uh, people compete to be the most, uh, you know, visa friendly to rich foreigners. Um, 
In fact, there's a whole website. Uh, um, there's a whole website dedicated to it called uh, the Nomad Capitalist. And there's this guy who just goes all over the world talking to various solicitors in countries and saying, you know, what's the cost? What's the standard of living? What's the cost of living? What's the geopolitical? What's the political climate like? And uh, <clears throat> where is it corrupt? And how much does it cost to buy citizenship? And in most cases, it's actually not much as much as you think. It can be. I mean, it's a few thousand, but it's not. You know, some some cases it is quite a bit. It's sort of quarter of a million dollars. They do it all in dollars. Anyway, look, don't worry. I'm not about to become a tax exile on my big hundred just yet. So don't worry. Okay. The angry podcaster will continue. I mean, have no fear. <laughs> Anyway, what I might do is, uh, rather than finish now, I'll tack on the second half of yesterday's podcast, which won't make any sense at all, because it sort of tailors into the thing that I was, you know, the ranting on about the engineer, but I've got it out of my system now, so it's gone. Uh, it's ranted. Can't do it. You can't pre- You can't repeat a rant. It has to be spontaneous, you know? It has to be... You have to be in the moment for a rant. You can't just say, oh, well, it's not an act. I hope you don't think this is an act. You have to, uh, you have to sort of feel it, you know. You have to have the pain in your veins, as Neville Bainbridge used to say. So I'll tack that on. If it doesn't make any sense, then then I'm apologise for that. But it'll make and it'll make the video a bit longer than normal. And uh, the cost of the meal at Centre Parks for six people and three children, aged three, one, and zero was 143 pounds I know I know I know I know you're thinking the same as I'm thinking but that did include the surcharge because we were a party of eight although we weren't we were a party of six that just happened to have three babes in arms that was Bella Italia at Centre Parks shout out to them For their child friendly policies. Okay, right, here you go, here comes the cut, here comes the cut. Are you ready? Steady, go! I think uh, it's just cut out because of lack of memory, because I didn't manage to upload yesterday's video, but we'll carry on nevertheless. What I was saying was, he's providing a service, and you and I are also providing a service, so what you can do is you can there are rich lessons to be learned if you only look at the way that other people are providing a service and and basically all those lessons are how not to do it okay what what mistakes they make how they do things wrong make sure you don't do the same so in in his case you know he's you know just like uh, he's not he's not taken sufficient care has he over the diagnosis and treatment planning of the, and let, or listen to the complain the symptoms he's not he's not looked at the signs he's just gone in with a pre a pre-made solution you know a bit like an implantologist really you know a bit like you know someone who's just learned to place implants and realize that they can charge about two thousand pound each for these implants and someone comes in who needs a root treatment all of a sudden needs an implant you know or someone who needs who could you know be better off with a denture because of the the fact that they lost all their teeth through high decay rate and lack of plaque control, all of a sudden is a is a is a brilliant implant candidate. And for him, everyone is an impeller candidate. Everyone is a candidate for the impeller that he keeps on his shelf because these motors, when they go, it's always the impeller. So anyway, I'm getting a new impeller. So at the end of the day, it might work, it might not. You know, it might fall off, it might break like the old myelometer on my Vespa again. Or the wing mirror on the Vespa. But uh, no, it was embarrassing. I was embarrassed, he was embarrassed, I was embarrassed for him. I was not that embarrassed because, I mean, really, his embarrassment was of his own making, wasn't it? He came round, he didn't ask what the problem was. He just assumed it was the same problem as last time. He jumped straight in. And I was embarrassed to have to tell him that, in fact, the problem that he thought it was wasn't the actual problem. And then he was embarrassed because he'd already got the thing in the back of the van. And then he had the embarrassing problem of having to explain to me 
<clears throat> that he's going to totally ignore the fact that he actually doesn't know what the problem is and didn't know what the problem was and he's going to take it back to his uh, 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 w the workshop anyway and um, you know when it, it could it could quite possibly have been something simple that could have been fixed with it in situ so you know, he's like you know well I'm going to charge you <laughs> I'm sorry mate but you're in the frame for 300 quid whatever it is you know <laughs> I've got to make a living you know <laughs> I've got to make a living I can't I can't just be you know wiggling wires around and just seeing if it's a slight a slight, slight loose wire or something it's got to have an impeller the, the, the impeller has got to be done <laughs> sorry plus anything else plus the real problem we'll fix the impeller and the other and the problem <laughs> Oh dear. I'm nowhere near him. So we're, um, so you know, but I had a guy in yesterday, got a broken tooth, you know, been got three types of filling in it. He's got, <laughs> he's got the vestiges of an old amalgam, he's got some, uh, uh, composite showing <clears throat> somewhere and it's got some glass eye on them of where it's been patched up and a bit of a bit of uh, pink gutter perker poking through from the root treatment <clears throat> and he said and this is funny because this bloke you know he, he was an incomplete course of treatment we'd recommended that he had this tooth ground and he decided that he wasn't he didn't <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> he just never came back and arranged to have it done and that as, as I said in previous podcast is that is that's quite common we we get about 60 percent of patients who don't return or rather patients don't return for 60 percent of the treatment we recommend the patients don't return <coughs> to have it done and that's mainly crown and bridge work and stuff like that because they just basically people just want stuff patched up a lot of people just want stuff patched up and then <coughs> but we do enough crowns and bridges to make it break even so that's all right and you have to tell people on the first visit, it's no use. You know, if someone comes in and they need 10 crowns, then you've got to look them straight in the eye and say, look, you know, you do know you need about 10 crowns, don't you? You know, because because if you don't on the first visit, on the second visit, if they come in and they say, oh, this tooth broken, and, and you say, yeah, well, you know, it broke because it, it should have been crowned. And they're like, well, why didn't, if it should have been crowned, why didn't you mention it the first time you saw me? And I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, what is your answer? You don't have an easy answer to that question. Even I don't have the answer to that question. Believe me, I've got the answer to most questions, but not that one. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know what the answer is to my sore throat. I got it on Sunday when I was um, glyphosating the garden. <clears throat> so I've probably got cancer. Thank you, Monsanto. No, actually, I don't mind. I don't believe all that about glyphosate. I love glyphosate. It kills everything. You have to be careful. And it's not a weed. It's not a, like a weed killer as such because you can't rust and spray it on anywhere where you want to grow anything. You know, it's really for paths and hard surfaces and stuff like that. We spray it around the apple trees because it increases the amount of rain that they get. Therefore, they get the apples get bigger. So around every apple tree and around every elm tree in my garden, there's like a bare circle because it just uh, increases the rainfall. So there we go. So that's gone off. But this guy came in yesterday and I said to him, look, you know, he didn't have, he didn't have this crown arranged. And so my receptionist rang him up and said, look, you know, you've got the, your course of treatment outstanding with a crown on it. Are you going to have it done? Can, we, can I get it organised for you or what? And he's like, what? <laughs> I'm not having it done. <laughs> so, next day he rings up. Oh, you know that tooth, uh, uh, it's broken. <laughs> okay, right, and you come. So he came in and I said to him, you know, and he said to me, what's what's the cost of this? So, and again, you know, my, my tip to you, if you're a young dentist and you're sort of, you're sort of setting out in the, um, and starting to charge people for things, you're gonna be hesitant about talking about the cost of stuff. Um, you know, because you're, by your very nature, you know, if you're a bit hesitant about w what type of washing up liquid to buy, whether you ought to get the, the expensive one or the cheap one, you're not going to um, be happy talking about hundreds of pounds. 
you know, you're, you're, and this is, we find this is a problem with the staff because the staff, I, I, I'm quite happily say that most of my staff and probably most dental staff in general could not afford private dentistry unless it was done, you know, free of charge by the boss. They are not, yeah, it's miles away. They could not afford it unless it was subsidised. They, they're not the sort of people that sort of can afford to spend those sort of amounts of money and therefore they won't talk about those sort of amounts of money. And there are ways of talking about it. You don't, <clears throat> so this bloke said, how much is this crown? So I said, well, it's going to need a post. So it's a crown and a post. The crown is 540 and the post adds about another 110. All right. So I didn't say the post is... <laughs> I didn't say the crown is 540 pounds and no new pence, and the pound is another, the, the, the post is another 110 pounds. I said it's 540 and another 110. <clears throat> and when you say it like, you know, <laughs> you could say, oh, it's 650. You know, but he can do the math. <clears throat> and it's 540 plus 110 sounds better than 650. And then you get the occasional patient who says, what, six pound 50? <laughs> So, yeah. so your best response to that is, yeah, six pound fifty. That's right. Yeah, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a private crown and a post for you for six pound fifty. <laughs> Before you even get halfway through that, they'll go, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, silly me. <laughs> uh, but you know, did did you know? And it, but you know, he needs to know the the cost in advance. That's fair enough. I am quite confident about telling him what the cost is. The only way that you can get confident about telling people what the cost is, is, is when you don't fear rejection. The only time you don't fear rejection is when you've got so much business and so much money coming in that you don't really care whether he has it done or not. They know whether you care, because they can tell where monkeys we sort of signal to each other. He can tell if you don't care. The minute you don't care, you'll get the business. The minute you do care, you'll lose it because <laughs> he'll say this bloke wants this too much you know he's wants this business too much therefore it must be far more in his interests to get this business than it is in my interest to have the work done it's all very subtle but the point is he was happy because he was the right solution for the right person at the right time you know there we go lovely all right, I'll have to do this in two bits. Sorry about that, but I'll try and make the cut as unobtrusive as possible, and uh, and uh, and uh, we'll start again tomorrow. All right, have a nice day at work. Anyway, bye, bye.